Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and what's next. It's a show that asks questions and peels back the layers of our average everyday experience and goes beyond scratching the surface. We interview people doing incredible things who are making a difference around the globe. Join me as we listen in and get one step closer to understanding that big ideas shared create collaboration. Collaboration can inspire community and communities create social change. I'm David Peck and this is Face to Face. So my next interview is with Stacey Tenenbaum and we chat about her new film Scrap here on Face to Face. Yes, the title of that is Scrap and uh, hopefully it's already conjuring up some interesting images for you. But Stacy and I, I mean, really, at, I suppose, at the end of the digital podcast-like day, Stacy and I really talked about recycling, but but we, we connected it, or, or we made connections with so many different uh, things and ideas and people. We talked about metal cemeteries. We talked about lament. And, and there was, and deep within this conversation, and frankly on the surface too, there's a call to action. We talked about how rust is really beautiful and this, this place called the Repair Cafe and, and, and what it means to learn an old craft. I learned a new world, a word called upcycling. Um, we talked about baggage and about scars and, and, and wisdom, something old and something beautiful. We talked about uh, this thing called an objective juxtaposition. And uh, we also talk about living in airplanes, actually. And you're going to you're gonna learn a little bit more about that if you end up watching the film. We talked about the idea of the right uh, to repair. And this just this really simple notion, what, what happens to things? And, and uh, you know, I might... I'm all about the call to action. And we, we, we talk about motivating people as well. Fun interview, beautiful, beautiful film, uh, worth watching for so many reasons. And uh, yeah, so so don't take your hands off the dial. I think you're going to really enjoy our next interview with Stacey Tenenbaum, but her new film, Scrap. Don't forget davidpecklive.com for more information about my writing and my speaking. Uh, you can uh, follow me there on my podcast as well. And if you are liking what we're doing here, please um, leave us a review on iTunes or Spotify. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast because that helps too. But leaving us a review would be genius. So please do that. And stay tuned. This film really is coming soon to a theater near you. It's called Scrap. And this conversation and interview here on Face to Face is with Stacey Tenenbaum coming right up. Well, welcome to Face to Face. We're joined by a very special guest here with us today. I, I'd, I'd like to say direct from Hot Docs, but not quite. We can't say that quite yet. But we have a writer, director, producer, filmmaker, storyteller. I'll let her uh, explain her CV a little bit more for you. Stacey Tenenbaum here is today on Face to Face to talk about her new film. Beautiful, stunning new film, Scrap. Stacey, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me here. It's great to uh, join you on the podcast. <laughs> It's so it's so fun to to be able to talk about uh, somebody's work like this in a way where you 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 see this story on the surface, and I think this is something I've learned with doc films over the years. And, and but then as you reflect back, and I take you know as I'm a bit of an academic, I take lots of notes and like to be able to refer to things. You start to peel back some of the layers, and there's just so much more going on than meets the eye. Can you tell us? a little bit about the context and maybe a couple of those reveals for you along the way, you know, cause I, can I already shout out there's, there's this beautiful sign on a door near the end of the film and I, and it says, stop, look and listen, if I remember correctly. And yep. isn't that what your film is really all about looking closer? It is, you know, I was a little worried that I wouldn't even be able to describe the film necessarily because it's it's kind of got all these little layers, like you say, and and I'm saying a lot of different things, and I I, I guess different people will take different bits of, from of it. Course. But I mean, on its surface, it's a film about what happens to things like ships and trains and planes and streetcars uh, when they're no longer useful, when they've sort of exhausted their you know life and they're at their end of the life and. Uh, a lot of them end up in these collections and these kind of strange metal cemeteries that that <laughs> I found all around the world. But I think more deeply, the film is about uh, our connection to things and the importance of things that, that in our lives. Uh, the fact that they, you know, hold our history and our cultural memory and even design, like the, the history of design of all of these different things that is kind of being lost. Um, so it's a bit of a lament 
mm. about the, our current condition and throwaway culture and what we're losing in that and sort of trying to hearken back to that old time when we repaired things and made them well and and sort of cared about them a lot more so i guess it has it does have a lot of different little bits to it there's there is absolutely a lot going on and congratulations on the uh the hot docs showing coming up uh very soon and and uh um uh, you're you're coming up in another festival as well why don't we do a couple shout outs right now before we step into some of those other layers so I have uh, the Hot Docs premieres on yeah, May 1st, uh, and that's so exciting because, I mean, it's been a long time that I've been making the film, but also sure. like a long time since anyone's been with audiences in a yes, cinema. Yes, yeah, absolutely. That's just so exciting. Like, you you know, there's nothing like that feeling of being in a cinema with people that are watching your film. Uh, so I have that. I have another screening on May 4th, which uh, at Hot Docs as well. And that, I think um, people, over, uh, people over 60 maybe, I'm not sure the age, but CBC pays for people to go uh, for free to movies before noon at Hot Docs. Uh, so that's a really cool screening. That is a, uh, that's a very cool out. thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I think and they give head- uh, schools too. I really have to double check that. Yeah, yeah, that sounds um, great. Oh, and by the way, the, the website, of course, is, is uh, scrapdoc.ca. Right. Find out more information about the film. Yeah. And you're also heading to San Francisco. Yeah. documentary channel people will be able to see this film on yeah. and hey let's quick quick cta shout out mm-hmm. if you got some old phones folks and you're coming to one of the screenings bring them with you tell us more stacy yeah okay so the the second big screening is my premiere in the u.s which is at Docklands film festival and that's in san Fran- rafael uh and what i'm doing at all my screenings for the film, including the theatrical release in Canada, is I'm telling people to bring in their old phones. And in Canada, I've partnered with uh, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, and they have a program called Phone It Forward. And what they do is they take your phone, they refurbish it, they load it with apps for people that have sight impairment to be able to use. So it's a great organization. You actually can just bring in all your old technology. They'll give you a tax receipt for your phone. (laughs) Like, it's just the best Wow, that's cool. Uh, So, and in the States, I partner with Secure the Call, and what they do is something very similar. They re- repair the phones. They they um, basically make these phones available to people who are in need. So with the elderly, uh, people in abusive situations. So like someone who needs a, a phone and might not be able to afford it. Isn't so that a great, great thing about about docu? I mean, about any kind of storytelling, really. The 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 call. There are kind of always call to actions. It seems to me just under the surface and sometimes maybe a little more prominent than in other, other ways of, of telling stories, but they're, they're usually there. And what I love about scrap is in your film is how many questions it raises, how many places it actually literally takes us around the world to see these, as you say, these graveyards, but it really does take us to some new places uh, uh, with respect to to things and materialism and, and recycling and so on. Um, I love that you use the word lament. It almost sounds materialistic to me in some way. Is that, you know what I mean? I know it's not, but it, isn't it so interesting that we're taking this old, rusty, broken down object and turning it into, in some cases, a more sacred, object and the whole space is going to change i think that in itself is just brilliant and so fascinating was that on your mind when you started yeah i guess lament might not be the best word because um in fact the film's really uplifting um (laughs) yes no for sure for sure but i know what i think i know what you mean like uh nostalgic maybe is that nostalgia was a big thing that i was going for because it's a it's a really intense emotion and i think that 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 resonates with people but um no i was definitely looking for people who were upcycling who were doing things so Mm. that that you didn't feel like the stuff just ended up in a graveyard and that was it and it's sort of sad and depressing (laughs) um so i was working i mean and when you say people that were turning them into something more sacred i was working with that architect who was building a church out of an old ship an old ocean liner so um i wanted to show that i wanted to show people and especially artists are artists creating stuff in and and sort of tackling environmental problems but in a very creative uh way so um i also had the sculptor who was making stuff out of old farm equipment uh and a photographer who wasn't necessarily making new stuff but she was bringing awareness to to the problem in india through her art so in a way the film which was unintentional um Mm. 
it, it sort of ended up featuring quite a lot of artists, which I hadn't set right, out to right. do. But in the end, I think it's it's a happy circumstance that that happened because I do think artists have a lot to bring to environmental discussions and they're often potentially left out of them. Uh, so um, I, I thought I think that's something kind of special in the film. I don't think I've ever seen a film with more cutting torches before in my, my life. I used to work in construction and they're fascinating tools, but they, they always scared me just a little bit. You know, it's, you know, when, when I've seen images of, uh, there's somewhere I believe in uh, Africa where planes are so, sort of go to be dumped and from the air, it is just the, 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 the most peculiar, tragic space because of, I think, all the things or many of the things you're trying to touch on in, in, in scrap. Um, and we typically would, would say the first words out of my mouth would be, oh, what an eyesore. And yet you've made this stunning, gorgeous film about garbage, basically. Yeah, well, I personally find those items to be really beautiful. <laughs> so I guess I wanted my goal was to to share that with an audience. Well, you've done a, a marvelous yeah. job of sharing that for sure. Uh, I mean, rust is really beautiful. It's just, you know, it's nature's art, right? Sure. sure. <laughs> um, so yeah, I have a lot of shots of just, you know, this beautiful abstract art that, that you know, nature makes, which is kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, there's definitely beauty that I wanted to show in these places. And I also think just if you're going to be attached to something, you have to see its beauty. So that was also part of why, if I want to make people more conscious of their throwaway culture and being attached to things, then I have to show them in a beautiful light. That was kind of my thinking going into the film. The, the young woman who's the photographer in, um, um, uh, is it Som Somya? Uh, yes, Somya, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so she, she used a great phrase, use and throw culture. I've never, I've never really heard that before. And, and you show her in the film, she's clearly an activist and, and an advocate and has a real passion about, about I'm gonna say changing the conversation. And she, she, she said something about, oh, you know, if I can just change, you know, five or five, maybe 5% of my audience. Um, do you think that's a lofty goal? I mean, what, and, and I don't mean for her herself, and, and I don't mean to be negative at all. I just sometimes wonder, you know, just about the, the whole preaching to the converted thing. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, wow, this is like, if you, if you watch this film and you don't take away something from it, how cynical are you? You know, <laughs> like, hey, donate your old phones. Blind people might be able to see things in a new way. You know what I mean? Like, wow, call to action. I think you know where I'm going with that. But but I'd love to hear a little bit more from you about that. Uh, were you, are you less cynical now? Maybe is the question. Well, I was never cynical. I'm like oh, a good really for, good optimistic for, good for you. person. Yeah, I don't know how you could be actually going into a film like this. Yeah, I, I really am. And I think that, you know... <sighs> I don't know if, if you can change people's minds or the way that they operate. Um, but, you know, having done the film, I just think it's so easy. Like there are such little simple things that you can do, uh, you know, even in terms of buying quality stuff like that, you know, that's made to be able to be repaired or, or learning how to repair, going to a repair cafe or, uh, you know, recycling or reusing things yourself. I mean, there, there's so many ways that are simple and creative that I think people can get involved. So sometimes these environmental problems look like they're so big that, mm -hmm. that it, you can't overcome them. Uh, and so that's something I was wanted to fight against with the film is just that there are ways, there are ways that you can bring your creativity to different problems and take small steps to be able to change your own consumption, um, consumption habits. I think that's something else that Somia, the photographer said, which is like, I'm not asking you to abandon your city life yeah, and all of right. your gadgets. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking that you use less or keep them longer. Like just even those two simple things, like save so much waste if everybody's doing it together. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it really is remarkable. And when you see those mounds of whatever it is, copper wire or, or phones or television screens or whatever they are, and I think a lot of us have seen that over the last, I'd say, 10 or 15 years, you start, you see that you see the impact of the one mm -hmm. grow, growing into the many. 
Definitely. And I mean, there in India, the shocking thing is this waste plant that I featured in the film was like dealing with this tiny, tiny, tiny right. proportion of the actual e-waste in India. <laughs> so, and when you see the amount of waste there, it's just staggering. And then you, you take it that next step and it's like, oh, wow, this is just like, you know, I think they're only recycling like 20% total of all their e-waste. So it's just a, a tiny little slice into uh, how big the problem really is. It, I, you know, it's interesting you say that the, the film is hopeful and lament. I mean, I think laments can absolutely be hopeful. That's my take, but I, I think it's super, hopeful in the sense that, uh, you know, would, would we have seen that conveyor belt e-waste plant in India 25 or 30 years ago? Maybe, but probably in a different way. I'm not sure there would have been a filmmaker there or a photographer there to capture it, to make, to make a statement. Um, sounds like you've been hopeful most of your life. Would you say you're more hopeful now, uh, as you've, uh, I don't know, met an architect who wants to build a church out of a, a rusty old boat. <laughs> That's just so cool. That's just amazing. And the sculptor, this, I mean, that's worth price of admission alone, seeing those sculptures uh, down, down in the Southern US, just absolutely stunning. So yeah, are you, are you more hopeful? I am. I, I mean, I think there is a movement back to repairing. And, and I think there is, you know, this whole idea of upcycling, which I didn't even know there was a word for it until well, recently. Well, I've never heard of a repair cafe before. Yes, what kind of, what kind of coffee exist. do they serve there, by the way? <laughs> I don't know. The coffee isn't the thing, but they teach you how to like, instead of throwing out your old blender, they'll fix it for you right. they teach you how to fix things. And uh, so I do see these movements and even with younger people that, that I think is, gives one hope, um, you know, and, and sort of the trendiness now of learning old crafts has sort of come mm. back into, you know, so there, there is this, I think, longing from people to get away from sort of something to, well, first of all, to have community, I think communities, you know, people have become a little bit alienated and, uh, you know, just having community is really important. So I think there's, there's this sort of turning back to maybe some of the stuff that we had in the past that was actually quite good <laughs> that just ended up disappearing. Like, like paper bags for groceries. I don't understand this. <laughs> like what, why are we not having paper bags? Like it's just an easy, easy thing uh, to get rid of a whole ton of plastic and they work well and they're nice and they're functional. Um, so I don't know. It seems that there are very, very simple ways to look at the past and be like, well, why did we get rid of, why did we stop doing that? That was good. <laughs> right. Right. Have, uh, have you made any of your own uh, extra special uh, uh, changes as a result of uh, spending, you know, the time on this film and these, these people's stories? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I've always had that ethos. Like I have a whole bunch of, I didn't know upcycling was a thing, but like I have a whole I, yeah, bunch of upcycled of items in my house, right? <laughs> that I bought on Etsy because I like people who craft. And uh, so I was already kind of doing it before I even knew I was doing it. And I, I, I like things that are mechanical, um, mm. that can be repaired. Like I'm really into stuff like that. Uh, and I do want to keep stuff longer. Like uh, I won't just, you know, throw away a phone and get a new one. Cause well, I there's mean, kind of, I think there's kind of a pride in it, isn't there? I mean, <laughs> let's be honest. There's something fun about buying a new shiny object and unwrapping it. There's it's a, it's a ritual of a sort, but I think there's something super cool about being able to fix that, fix that broken toaster or sharpen that knife that you might've gotten rid of a few years ago because you hung out at a repair cafe. I'm going to have to look that up by the way. It's a thing. It's a it's, thing. We're, it's, we're actually doing a, um, a special event for a world environment day, world earth day environment day, ah, June 5th, um, where we're doing, uh, we partnered with a whole bunch of repair cafes in Canada and the US, and we're doing a screening of the film. So scrap fixer mixer. So people are going to mm. watch the film together and they're going to fix stuff and sort of be in communities together. And that's happening in 16 different locations. So all across Canada and the US uh, that's being organized with a whole bunch of repair cafes yeah, to actually so just connect people with the film and to get them fixing a game. Yeah, that's so, so cool. I spent a fair bit of time in Southeast Asia and Cambodia in particular. My listeners will know that for sure. And uh, fairly over the years, a fairly war-torn country, a lot of unexploded ordnance, AK-47. And there were a couple artists who were building absolutely stunning sculptures out of dismantled uh, machine guns. And kind, kind of like the sculptor in your film. I mean, just 
gorgeous, just yeah. absolutely stunning. Was he the 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 um, the guy whose father said he said something like, "My dad loved scrap metal." Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of a laugh out loud moment, really. Um, what, 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 I mean, you, you talk about, we, we, we think about hoarding a little bit as we watch this film and collectors. And I know a few, and I I've collected cards and comics and those kinds of things over the years. It is remarkable what people will collect. What, what, what is it? Any insights there into human nature? You know, is it, are we typically hoarders, uh, you know, uh, street cars, really? <laughs> Yes, that guy is I mean, a hoarder. How, how, how about how about matchbooks? Let's start with matchbooks, you know, or or maybe graduate to spoons. Yeah. Um, no, but I think that 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 especially the guy who's collecting these streetcars, yes, it's kind of an extreme collecting <laughs> habit, I would say. Yeah, he has yeah. over 30 streetcars. Wow. Um, but it's also he did it out of his wanting to preserve the history. So he mm. saw all these streetcars being put out taken off the the streets and um he just couldn't let them go he kept on buying them up uh and and i think that's important because he saved them in a way he you know and they he managed to get a few of them restored and they're being used now but i think like like i said earlier it's like we're we're losing chunks of our history if we're just scrapping these things and 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 not somebody's not having the foresight to save them. Like the guy who saved all those phone boxes in England that are so iconic. Like how could you even imagine they would have thrown out all the British phone boxes and, and they would have just disappeared from the earth. Like it doesn't make mm. any sense. Right. Mm. So I think that that impulse is, is kind of maybe mixed with a certain amount of foresight in terms of we don't want to lose this, or there's something important in this that needs to be preserved. Didn't the the man, uh, the architect who was kind of managing sort of the dismantling of the ship in order to get the right pieces for the for the church that was being built, didn't he say something to the effect of new objects don't have character? Yeah. That's that that's really interesting to I'm not sure I totally philosophically agree with that on a on a certain level, but I know exactly what he's saying. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's I that, love it's that. that. Isn't it that wooden spoon that's been that's been worn out over time and the, the amount of love and care and tenderness that went into cooking and so on? Isn't mm -hmm. that really what he's talking about? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that was something that I did want to get across in the film. And he's not the only person to touch on that. Uh, and I really felt that it's kind of like even people when, when they get older, they get more interesting and they sort of carry their baggage and their scars and all sure. of the things they picked up in their lives, you know, their wisdom. Uh, and, and I really wanted to do that tie kind of between people and things and, and showing the beauty of something and learning to appreciate something that's old and has a lot of character and patina and, you know, is showing the life that they lived on their surface. I think that's actually what the architect ended up saying that, that that's what makes us unique. That's what makes us special. Mm. Uh, so uh, I definitely did want to draw that parallel in the film. Yeah. Typically, typically we, we, we think, I, I really do think we look most of us and look at objects as if, you know, they're, they're, we're, we're transactional. I guess, mm -hmm. right? About objects. Okay. Mm -hmm. Once the pen, once the pen's finished, boom, in the garbage it goes. The the the, the pencil's broken, let's throw it in the fire, et cetera, et cetera. How many extensions of that are there? But I love that scrap and these people's, these people's stories have certainly uh, made me now want to take a second and a third look at not only um, I guess, what did you call it? Upcycling? I was mm -hmm. gonna I was gonna use reuse, but but I love <laughs> upcycling or uh, phoning it forward awesome. It just, it, 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 it makes you want to step back and say, hang on a minute here. Maybe it's not meant for the garbage bag quite yet. Definitely. And I think, you know, if you think of the things that, that are dear to you, I mean, they, they often hold like memories, right. Of the people that use them of, of, you know, some memory that you had, like, like the guy in the car the, that's collecting those cars, he's like, you know, it might remind you of your first date or right. like all of these things can sort of bring back memories. Like they have a lot of power in them. Uh, and so that's what I kind of wanted to show in the film that, uh, there's a lot like when, when you keep something a long time, it, it gets more and more meaningful to you. I think there's something deeply, deeply philosophical and existential about your film and, and what you're trying to say through 
um, <clears throat> I guess through objects, but through technology, I suppose, on a, on a certain level as well. I'm sure uh, William Gibson will, will, will have a, a heyday with this film, you know, in some respects. I love, especially the, the opening sequence of the, um, one of the, of the two men, I think, talks about the, not going back, well, maybe going back to nature and how they're kind of becoming a part of nature and that, mm -hmm. that melding of, of metal and, and machine with, with, uh, with the natural, I suppose, right? Mm -hmm. There's something really interesting there to me uh, that, yeah. that, that should be explored about who we are and what, what's our relationship to this earth, you know, mama earth as my yoga, mm -hmm. Tif Tiffany, my yoga instructor would say, you know, and you know, what's interesting, isn't it fascinating? Would you agree with this? Language kind of changes everything, images, kind of change everything, juxtaposition and so on. I mean, is that your goal uh, as a storyteller, as a writer, as a director, as a producer? And if you want to talk a little bit about how hard this movie was to make, go right ahead at the same time. Because <laughs> you were kind of everything, right? Yes. Yeah, I did a lot of the work. Um, but it was definitely my goal. I knew this film was going to be a really visual film because I knew that the, just the, the images were so powerful. So I, I think that they do have, they do say a lot just by by seeing the images themselves. So that was something I did want to let breathe and sort of be a huge part of the film. Um, it was a hard film to make. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> It took me about two years to raise the money. Uh, mm. I got rejected my entire first year for every which way but sideways. Wow. Um, Interesting. Yeah, it's not an easy concept to do grasp. You wanna, do you want to just take a minute to shame anyone on, on the face to face <laughs> here? Uh, no, Stacey? you know what? It was good because <laughs> I actually refined things and made them better. Yes. And it gave me a year to think and to, to do the work that I needed to do. So um, I came back the next year. I finally got it, all the money together. Um, we did two shoots. And our after our second shoot, we got shut down by COVID. Uh, we were actually in Spain. We just managed to get out of Spain before they cut close the whole country down uh and wow. then you know it was a, a lot of directing by zoom um trying to find crews in different cities and countries that would be able to replicate the look that was so key to this film that that my cinematographer Kathleen uh, Jiguer, uh she started the film and had a, just a beautiful beautiful aesthetic to it so I had to ensure with different camera people that everyone would sort of maintain that throughout so that was that was a little challenge uh, <laughs> often I was directing by zoom different time zones you know um, all kinds of just technical problems the entire film was edited uh using zoom i was never in the same room as my editor i know that sounds a bit like i'm starting to sound like a zoom commercial that's not my intention <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but, is there a special uh, on today stacy yeah. yeah exactly but yeah it, it was a, it was a really long long tough i bet yeah, yeah that's that's uh, well i'm glad you stuck with it and uh um, it's and it's a it's a stunning film the cinematography is absolutely gorgeous mm -hmm. and and I think it's interesting. Is it her name in Thailand? Fa? Is that her name? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, she, her line about, um, I, I don't like it when people refer to this as a graveyard. Again, mm -hmm. isn't that what Scrap is really all about? This idea of seeing the world with not, not new eyes, but through a new lens. Yeah. And I think that, um, I mean, I used to tell people it was a film about love, loss and rebirth, but <laughs> mm, mm. I, I mean, it doesn't really describe what the film is. Um, but I mean, there are definitely themes of life and death and rebirth mm. that are that are sort of woven throughout the film and graveyards part of that. Is it really a graveyard or is it, you know, a means for her to support her family? Like, so I, I did want to play with those that kind of terminology and those kinds of ideas throughout the film. Yeah, she struck me as a very strong woman and quite a character. That's for yeah. sure. How many people is it? She did she say she's supporting? Uh, was it eight kids and seven adults or something? By or, yeah, or vice versa. I and, forget. And, but and yeah. I hope we're teasing. I hope we're teasing our listeners enough that they're going to want to watch the film as a result of this. But yeah, this is a whole sequence that's really quite remarkable. That that's uh, all about entrepreneurship and about about making. Uh, uh, wonderful things happen with very little, it seems to me. And, mm -hmm. and what an unusual uh, and, and tragically beautiful story there that you've told 
in, in some respects. Yeah, I, I like this the part of her story where she's like, they have the, they live in an airplane. So it, for people who haven't seen the film yet, she's housing her family in this airplane graveyard. They've built a home out of an airplane. And then she says, but I'd never want to fly in an airplane. <laughs> so she actually like has found a whole secondary use for the airplane, but like the primary use of it, like she has no interest in all and like actually getting into an airplane and flying somewhere. So I thought that was kind of hilarious. It's pretty, there's a, there's a lot of room for comedy there too. Imagine all the time spent cleaning the windows. I mean, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Think all those window coverings you're going to have to launder. Yeah. It's fascinating to me. Stacy. what did you learn about, I've spent a fair bit of time in international development, uh, you know, consulting with NGOs and nonprofits around the world. And did, did you learn anything? Did you take anything away from, oh, I don't know, the this economic sort of mess that we find ourselves in the the gap we hear about the gap closing in some places in this middle class and so on and yet it seems a film like yours reminds me at least of that gap you know um it's not that I, i'm looking down on fa and her family and living in a plane uh they're incredibly industrious and entrepreneur and that's amazing yeah um, but I, I wonder any thoughts on that? Did, did, did that even enter into your idea behind the film? Or did you think maybe you might touch on that in some respects as you went along? I mean, the, the income gap, I don't really directly address it. I mean, for me, Fa living in an airplane linked, linked as a story to the guy that's an architect and building a church out of a boat. Like for me, that's kind of the same story in my world. And right. it's not, nice. I mean, obviously they have huge economic and educational and whatever gaps between them, but that, that really wasn't the focus of the film. But I mean, obviously separate from this film, I do care about income inequality. And, and I think that a large part of that is because of greed. Mm -hmm. um, and that does fit into the film because, you know, there are these corporations that aren't allowing you to fix your phone or fix your car or fix your farm equipment. Right to repair is a huge thing that I'm, I'm very interested in. I've partnered with different organizations. Okay, You're just, you're just coming raise. out with all kinds of new <laughs> phrases, the right to repair. That's fantastic. Yes, it's, I don't, I don't make this up. This is the real thing. Um, so these corporations, uh, even in Canada, they're trying to pass legislation to give consumers the right to be able to repair their, their phones and different things because companies lock you out of them and then you have to your your warranty might not be valid if you don't go to their supplier in person to fix it and whatever so but the corporations are stopping them from doing that so i think greed is a big source of of sort of all kinds of bad mm. stuff in our society uh including the income gap I mean, that the, the, the it, it sort of goes all the way down. But um, that is something that I'm really interested in, which is it's stopping this kind of corporate greed. And not only that greed of people, like generally, mm -hmm. like the idea that you have to have the newest iPhone and the newest this and the sort of all of that rat racy stuff that doesn't really give us any kind of fulfillment. Um, well, fast, fast fashion is is pretty interesting, right? That, that I, too. I know, so I think that that whole ethos is something that I am yeah. looking at in a a certain way through the film. Yeah, I, I really do think that the film, uh, you know, su a subtext of the film is is that economic gap, what industrialization, what has it done to us? Mm -hmm. What What is it? I mean, I think what you're doing beautifully is showing what maybe it's given to us, ironically, in a way, mm -hmm. right? Through these <laughs> metal pieces of what we used to think were garbage, yeah. you know, that that should have been melted down. And, and maybe some of them should be melted down. But but I think it's a, yeah, it's just so, so refreshing. Again, I can't remember the name of the sculptor, but I, I'm pretty sure it, it was his father. Again, the, the guy who loves scrap metal, which I love, by the way, uh, said when he was talking very affectionately about his father, he made me look closer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. His name is John Lopez. He's a huge, huge talent. You're, you're, I mean, even if you don't see the film, you should just look him up online. Just look him up. He does beautiful, beautiful Incredible work. Incredible work. Stunning. Yeah. yeah. And, but I think that's the job of artists generally, mm. or people with an art, artistic sensibility is they might look at things differently than, than normal people do. I mean, even me, like I also, I don't find the, the, the line uh, that he was really into scrap metal funny because like i'm kind of really into scrap metal <laughs> so oh, okay uh, sorry yeah yeah, oh, yeah. I, i'm the, really the into camera scrap pans metal. down and you're wearing a t-shirt that says i love scrap metal <laughs> yeah 
Yeah. Very so, funny. Uh, I mean, I, I think that artists just generally look at the world a little sure. differently. Uh, so, so yeah, that, that seems natural to me that that would be a part of the film. Yeah. We well, stop, and look and listen. Stop, look and listen. It's, it's really, it's really, really quite, quite remarkable. Um, uh, Som, Somya's uh, a line about, you know, kind of sort of suggesting, I can't really do much about this, but I, at least I need to photograph it through this mm -hmm. object, through this mm -hmm. piece of super high technology. But what I loved about the next uh, line, and I'm so glad you left this in, you know, her passion, her commitment to changing the world in a sense, you know, in her part of the world, I'm, I, I got to get it out there. Mm -hmm. I got, is that part of what scraps about for you? Is it, is it, are you saying to me, Hey, Peck, get off your, your materialistic arse and, and, and maybe bring down a phone or two next time you see me or write a letter to somebody or, or, or whatever, hold a garage sale and donate the money to a local community center. Is, is that a, is that a subtext in the film? Yeah, definitely. When I started making the film, like I always knew that I wanted to like address the question of what happens to things like, mm. like it wasn't a question yeah. that people were talking about, you know, what happens to them? Where do they go? Like nobody was kind of asking that question. So I knew I wanted to just show people that kind of like Somia did in the film. Well, this is where the things go. This is, this is it people. Uh, and, and I think there's power in that just knowing, just asking the, that question and seeing where stuff ends up. Um, can motivate people. Um, and mm. when I was doing the film, I also knew that I wanted to have an impact campaign after. So if people decided that they were really kind of felt bad that their phones ended up in India, they could have other means of um, well, of be becoming involved or of changing their life habits. So on my website, scrapdoc.ca, I have all my partners listed and the partners are in four different areas. So I have people who are working on right to repair that are actually politically active and you can get active in that way. I have upcyclers who are just making beautiful stuff and you can go and buy their stuff and support them. I mean, there's so there's all different kinds of ways that people can get involved. And I wanted them to if they saw the film and were inspired or wanted to change that they would have somewhere to go to you know be in a community of people who are already doing this or finding out little ways that they could change or create change so that that was always a goal with the film i tell you i will never drive by a garbage dump and 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 see it in the same way ever again you know <laughs> it's i think that's a beautiful thing and i mean it just really you know uh, imagine, you know, I just went to a thought of shaking a recycling bucket, you know, full of glass and metal and the sounds that are coming out of it. I've never had that thought or that before, and I'm not going to start making any kind of metal sculpture, I promise you. But isn't it wonderful that Scrap has taken me there even just to, to peel back a little layer to have this other insight. I mean, Stacy, isn't, and I, sadly, we got to wrap up here in a couple of minutes, but isn't, isn't, I mean, we need objects. We need things, we need tools mm -hmm. to build, we need drawers to put things in and pens to write books and novels and so on. But maybe we don't need as many, um, but isn't isn't Scrap really about making better choices as well? Is that? Uh... Definitely, I think, you know, it's, it's the magnitude of the waste being created that's tragic. Mm. Um, so <laughs> if you can keep things longer, if you can buy better, uh, there, there's all these very, very simple things that, that you can just do to, to change the way. Or like you said, garage sales. I'm a huge garage sailor, right? <laughs> like someone else can use that object. It's, you know, it might have, you know, it's not good for you anymore, but it, it can be passed down or reused. Or So there's so many little ways that, uh, that we, can, we can change our behavior. Absolutely. So. I was converted to garage selling about 20 years ago. Honestly, my wife, Elizabeth and her mom, and I, and I went to one, I'm like, really? No. Right. Like kind of condescending about it and making sarcastic jokes as we're going way too early on a Saturday morning. I will say that, but, and all that crazy garage sailors are out like 6 a.m. Right. They've, they've <laughs> even beaten you there by 8 a.m. So forget it if you want the really good stuff, you know, but yeah, I think it's absolutely brilliant and i think one of the things that cracks me up the most is an item can be 50 cents and somebody's gonna barter for well i'll give you a quarter <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's true just, i yeah. i've been on both sides of the table oh, I, I have that, to say i do i do hold garage sales because i i have a lot of stuff i do yeah. um and i've also been to many i i love 
I love old things. I like things that have character that have been used that have history. So garage sales are a great place to uh, is that, find is that. Is that, is that upcycling in action? <laughs> it's uh, repurposing, I guess, or, repurposing, uh, or nice. there's also this new term called the circular economy, which is um, finding different ways to use something so you can extend its life. So garage sailing would fit so straight good. in that, that sort of realm. I what would, would Karl Marx have done with a circular economy? <laughs> well, that's the problem. You know, they, they don't want that. Mm. The companies don't want that. They don't want to create objects that are made to last. And that's another whole thing is if you're going to have less waste, it has to, your production has to change. The way that they're making stuff has to change so that stuff is built to, to last longer. Well, I know, I mean, you know, repair. just practically too, cars are heading that way. You know, this mm -hmm. idea of the hybrid and the electric car, there's very yeah. few moving parts. It, it is going to put a lot of people ultimately, I suppose, out of business, but we hope and trust yeah. it will create other uh, roles and purposes and jobs and so on. But, and, you know, we're dreaming of a, a greener planet, I suppose, but it seems like a, a, a way forward. Um, you know, I just, again, another thought here, I want to share this with you and, and maybe wrap up with a final um, practical question, but the shots you have of, I'm going to, I'm going to call it the ship graveyard. And I think it's Bangladesh or maybe in mm. India somewhere are absolutely stunning. They look like models from like, um, industrial light and magic, you know, mm. and they're gorgeous. And yet I personally find them a little unsettling. And I've always found, I even said to Elizabeth, my wife, while we were watching, I, I said, you know, I've always found them a little creepy, you know, ships being around them. And I wonder if there's something connected to that sense of uh, history or sense of memory or what came before that is kind of you know, existentially creeping me out in some way, you know, and yeah. I don't know if that's true, but I've certainly never had that thought. So thanks for bringing that up because I think it's brilliant, but it's always, yeah, they've always kind of weirded me out in a way that, that I haven't been able to explain. And I think scrap may be a stepping stone to coming to a better understanding for me, which is brilliant. Oh, wow. Well, I'm happy that I can do that for you. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, those images are particularly difficult images because um, in places like Bangladesh and India, it's it's a highly polluting industry mm. um, and also a dangerous industry for people oh. who are being paid very little money. Um, so bet. those were really disturbing images for sure. But I, I think the actual ship that we worked on was at a... a, a shipbreaker that was doing the job in an environmentally friendly way. And I think that made a big difference to me. Um, but you still get this like feeling of the life that used to be on that ship yeah. and, and sort of the sadness of, you know, yes, the life that it. it lived. That's right. Maybe yeah. it's, maybe it's something to do with the sadness. I, I think for, you know, if you could walk through a, a ship that had sank might, you know, and they had brought mm -hmm. it up to the surface and it was a museum, I think there would be a little bit of that going on, which I think is a beautiful reflection or lament uh, mm -hmm. on, on, on history and, and where we've come from and where we've, where we're going to. Um, so, so what does this mean for my kids, your kids, the younger generations? I hope everyone sees this film by the way, and I hope it gets into high schools and kids are writing, never mind kids, I hope people are writing essays about this going forward. But what's your hope there for the impact campaign? Um, well, I'm hoping definitely that educational will be a big, um, big part of this and that they will bring it into schools and, uh, and be able to start discussions um, around the film. We are we're developing a discussion guide that people can use and teachers can use to uh, work with their classrooms and stuff like that to Amazing. delve into some of these topics. I mean, the, maybe the death is not great for right. <laughs> young kids. <laughs> right. But, right, yes. But uh, so, yeah, we are, we're hoping that that an educational that it'll have like a very long life in educational yeah it's, well. it's amazing so so many so many touch points so many uh, uh thought experiments here and, and questions asked and raised and and some answers given too i think so th thank you so much i um uh after san francisco documentary channel in canada is where people are going to be able to see this hopefully yeah. any any your work in the u.s fall. probably um, uh, so, uh, we're going to do a theatrical release in Canada in the summer, late nice. summer, probably in August. And then after that documentary channel will, um, broadcast the film, uh, probably in the fall sometime. Great. And, uh, then it will be on CBC gem. Uh, so, so coming soon to, to some kind it. of theater near you. 
uh, hopefully. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then I'm looking for a US release as well. Yeah. So that's still up in the air. And I'll also be doing lots of festivals over the spring and summer. Uh, and the best place to stay up to date on that is on my social media. So uh, I'm go. on Twitter, Instagram, the whole thing. So you can look up Scrap Doc or Scrap Documentary and you should be able to find me. Awesome. Thank you so much. And congrats again on Hot Docs. Look forward to uh, maybe even uh, connecting with you there. And and uh, I'm, I'm hopeful for you on the first q and I, I hope, uh, I'm sure the showing is going to go brilliantly and you're going to get some great questions. But uh, thank you so much for your time today. We've been talking with Stacey Tenenbaum, uh, her new film premiering at uh, uh, Hot Docs here in Toronto, Canada, that is, for those of you who don't know. And the film is Scrap. Stacey, thank you so much for your time and your generosity here today on Face to Face. Thank you. Well, there you have it. That was my interview with Stacey Tenenbaum uh, talking about her uh, beautiful and compelling new film, Scrap. We talked about a whole lot of things. We covered some serious ground. Check it out. Coming soon to a theater near you. I would imagine you'll be able to see it uh, on, a, on a digital platform at some point in the not so distant future. Put it in your calendar. This is the kind of film that you are going to want to see at some point uh, down the road. And the website is scrapdoc.ca. Uh, and um, yeah, something old and something beautiful. What happens to things? Some great questions in the in the conversation. Some um, beautiful imagery and beautiful things to to consider and think about and to create within the context of the film as well. Don't forget davidpecklive.com for more about my writing and my uh, speaking and podcasting. You can. Um, listen to almost one of 600 interviews there and go back and check out some of our history but please do leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts and don't forget to subscribe you've been listening to face to face and my name is david peck